All right. I, I have no disclosures to make, and in fact, after today's talk, I think Big Pharma won't uh, want to have anything to do with me at all. <laughs> so what I want to help you with today is to, to try to develop a, a way of using evidence and method to limit drug exposure in later life. Uh, in later life. And there's two ways of, of looking at this. One is, is to look at the so-called PIMS, or potentially inappropriate medications, such as are defined in, in the beers list. And among the, the PIMS, I'm going to particularly talk about the PAMs, that is to say the benzodiazepines and, and related drugs. The other uh, direction is to look at it uh, with regard to the medications that are recommended under clinical practice guidelines and how to decide which of those to use, which ones might have potential payoff within, say, a decade. So who has a decade to live? Well, basically everyone over the age of 80, because the median life expectancy in BC for men at age 80 is 8.26 years, and for women is 10 years. And you could add to that people who are in their 70s but have a major comorbidity of some sort, such as stage 3 or 4 COPD, stage four or five CKD, residual cancer, and heart failure, and certainly everybody in a complex care facility because the uh, me median life expectancy from admission is in the range of two to three years for patients in complex care. So the PIMS, or potentially inappropriate medications, um, are those medications that a panel of experts have decided are more likely on average to do, to do harm than good. Um, in the UK, they use STOP criteria. In Germany, they, they use Priscus. But in North America, we tend to use the Beers criteria, which have been updated in 2012 by the American Geriatric Society. And they're available that, at the website shown on, on, uh, on the slide. So the Beers list, uh, and it's a long list, and I've just uh, included a few of the drugs from the Beers list here. And it's not saying that we absolutely must not ever prescribe these drugs for the elderly, but it's at least saying there's a big red flag next to these drugs. And when we prescribe one, we should at least have made sure we really think about this and really ask ourselves whether we've uh, exhausted other possibilities, pharmacologic pharmacological and non-pharmacological. And for instance, the benzodiazepines and Z drugs that are on the list I'm going to focus on a little bit later in the talk. Here's more of the, of the drugs on the beers list, and I, and I don't intend to go through them one by one. Also on the beers list, you have a list of drug-disease interactions. So for instance, they're saying that in heart failure, you should avoid using COX-2 inhibitors and diltiazem. In syncope, avoid using cholinesterase inhibitors. In epilepsy, avoid bupropion and tra tramadol, et cetera. In falls, avoid using SSRIs. And also the beers list uh, gives a list of what they consider to be strongly uh, anticholinergic uh, drugs. And we are, in general, to avoid using anticholinergic uh, drugs, especially combinations of anticholinergic drugs. So I encourage you to have access to the beers list, either on paper or electronically, and to, to use it as, as you're doing your medication reviews. <laughs> So now let's change directions and look at the possibility of limiting potentially appropriate drugs as uh, recommended by clinical practice guidelines. Boyd and colleagues uh, took a hypothetical 79-year-old woman with osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, hypertension, diabetes, and COPD, and applying clinical practice guidelines to her, they calculated that she would need 12 medications taken in 19 doses at five different administration times. So do we really mean this? Do we want to do this? And the Canadian uh, Cardiovascular Society uh, dyslipidemia guidelines would suggest that every man age 75 or older would score enough Framingham points just from age alone to make a statin indicated regardless of total cholesterol level. And using uh, Osteoporosis guidelines of bisphosphonate would be indicated in 90% of all women in complex care using current criteria. So we've created a monster here that, that needs to be tamed. So we could ask the question, well, which drugs are actually doing the most harm? And Budnitz and, and colleague looked at 265,000 emergency room visits for adverse drug events. 
and found that the drugs on the beers list actually only contribute about 5% of, of the adverse events. And the big culprits are things like warfarin, aspirin, and other antiplatelet drugs, insulin, oral hypoglycemics, et cetera. So it's largely the clinical practice guideline related drugs that are, are doing the most harm. So I've got to look at a few specific situations as you're reviewing your, your, your med lists. So the first is aspirin when used for primary prevention of vascular events. And I see patients all the time in the specialized seniors clinic who come in taking aspirin strictly for the purpose of, of primary prevention. And if you look at the numbers for that, say using the uh, antithrombotic trialist collaboration, which is a meta-analysis, the absolute risk reduction for taking uh, primary prevention aspirin is 0.06% per year with a number needed to treat for one year of 1,666. Well, clearly this is ridiculous. So I would give a big red light to the idea of using aspirin for primary prevention, at least in patients with, with a decade to live. And I note that aspirin for primary prevention is not recommended under the Canadian guidelines, and it's also on the beers list. Aspirin for secondary prevention is a bit different uh, because it depends on why you're taking it. And I think we have this tendency to want to lump all vascular diseases together. But if what you have is just peripheral arterial disease, the absolute risk reduction is less than a percent. And so I certainly wouldn't use aspirin in that case in, in this population. On the other end of the scale, you've got patients with a recent MI, a fresh MI, where the numbers are actually very good. And certainly I would recommend using aspirin in that setting. And then you've got people with remote MI and stroke. You know, say your patient who had an MI 15 years ago and really has been asymptomatic since. Well, you could go either way on, on that one depending on what sort of condition your patient's in. Now, statins for primary prevention, for me, they get the big red light. Uh, the numbers, and we don't have great data, but uh, using the, the data from, from the elderly segment of the JUPITER trial, the absolute risk reduction is about 1.23% per year, which is, in, in my books is low. So I would not recommend using uh, a statin in these patients for uh, primary prevention. And by extension, I also wouldn't recommend screening patients over 80 for, with cholesterol levels because you wouldn't treat them anyway. Statins for secondary prevention are a bit different. Again, it really depends on what kind of vascular disease the patient has. If the patient has peripheral arterial disease or stroke, these are not good indications for taking a statin. The numbers are very poor, certainly under 1%. Whereas if you have a fresh MI, a new MI, the evidence for high-dose statins is very good with an absolute risk reduction of around 8%. And then you get the ones that are in between where you'll have to, to, to pick and choose and decide based on individual patient characteristics. Well, I, I think in the studies that were done in, in Prove It, Timmy, these were people who just had an MI and they were started on high dose uh, statins immediately after their, their MI, so fresh, fresh. How long did that keep going? Yeah. I can't remember the length of the Prove It, Timmy trial, but it was not more than two years. So I don't think we know when the top end is, when you would, when you would stop that. I think that's an unknown. Okay, um, anticoagulation, a, a hot topic. Um, the issue here is that the, the risks of stroke and the potential benefits from warfarin increase exponentially with age and also increase exponentially with CHADS-2 score. So you'll see the data there from the Framingham Heart Study where the five-year risk of stroke rises quite dramatically with increasing age. We do have two trials that have been done specifically in warfarin on the elderly, uh, WASPO and BAFTA. I'll just quote numbers from BAFTA because it's a larger trial. So in this uh, elderly uh, cohort, older cohort, the absolute risk reduction was in the range of 2% per year over and above aspirin. Uh, and the interesting part of both BAFTA and WASPO is they both showed higher bleeding rates in the aspirin group than the warfarin group something not seen in the younger patient populations. With the caveat being that some people would say this isn't a real world study because the investigators were controlling the INRs and, and the warfarin. So what to do with anticoagulation in the old, old? Well, certainly in the palliative care set, you're not going to use either aspirin or warfarin, I, I, I would say. And I, I would never want to view 
aspirin as being the kinder alternative to warfarin because you may be exposing people to all of the, the same harms but a few of the, of the benefits. So in people very close to the end of life, uh, maybe neither, the ones who make the best candidates for warfarin would be those ones that are older um, and have high CHADS2 scores but are still relatively independent. So that's the cherry picking end of things. And then unfortunately you've got that big group of people that are in between that you're going to have to decide on and discuss with patient and, and, and family. Beta blockers for heart failure, the numbers are actually fairly good. I gave it a yellow light, but it's close to a, a green. So we have the senior study which was done in older people with heart failure, not just with reduced ejection fraction that showed a 2% improvement per year in mortality and cardiovascular hospitalization. So certainly worth considering in your older patients even in the last decade of, of life. Now the bisphosphonate literature, it's just such a, a morass. It's really hard to, to interpret and there are many caveats and, and, and limitations to it. One of them being that the studies on, on bisphosphonates have mixed together primary prevention and secondary prevention. So to get into the study, you either had to have low T scores or you had to have a, a prevalent fracture. Well, these are two different groups of people. And also their idea of a prevalent fracture was to do an x-ray of your spine and see if you have evidence of a, of a compression fracture on there that you may have been completely unaware of. And then at the end of the study, do another x-ray and find out if there's any more compression fractures. So these aren't, aren't really real world events, um, as it were. I think the important um, point I've highlighted there, and that's that the time to benefit ranges from quite short for vertebral fractures. These drugs work well for vertebral, all drugs work well for vertebral fractures, to longer for other clinical fractures and to very long for hip fractures. So it really depends on what it is that you're trying to, to prevent in your patient. Also, study patients comply with their bisphosphonate regimen. Nobody else does. Um, in fact, in one study of, of the weekly bisphosphonate uh, regime that you're also familiar with, the mean persistence rate was 184 days, which is six months. So six months out, only 50% of the patients are still actually taking their weekly bisphosphonate uh, regime. So I would give the red light to those who've had a, a clinical fracture with limited life expectancy. So let's say a, a nursing home patient, uh, somebody in your nursing home, uh, they fall and break their hip, they go to hospital, they come back having had it pinned, do you put them on a bisphosphonate? I would say no, because chances are their life expectancy is sort of two years or, or less and, and you're really not going to accomplish anything much in that period of time other than maybe vertebral fractures which they perhaps didn't have in the first place. On the cherry picking end of things, I would take patients who have symptomatic vertebral fractures and you want to prevent more vertebral fractures because we know we actually have much better efficacy and a shorter time to, to benefit with these uh, patients. And then you get the in-betweens and so a common scenario for me would be somebody who's community dwelling, so a, a, a somewhat better uh, older person, community dwelling who has a hip fracture and who's returning uh, to their home environment, not to a nursing home. What would you do with them? Um, what I'm going to suggest to you is that uh, on the basis of the Horizon recurrent fracture trial, you certainly want to try to push them towards IV zoledronate. Because uh, in this study uh, of over 2,000 people who had a hip fracture, so you know they had a significant fracture, uh, they were given IV zoledronate within 90 days. The absolute risk reduction in a year was 2.6%, and in addition to that, you had an almost 2% benefit in, in mortality. The cost, of course, is, is significant at about $750 per year. But So in that community dwelling hip fracture patient, I encourage them to do the IV zoledronate. And if they can't, well, I'm just a little bit less keen to go the oral uh, bisphosphonate route, but I would in some cases. So I do want to point out that there are American Diabetes Association guidelines uh, for the elderly. Um, now tight glycemic control is a very long game. And we're dealing with people who don't have that many, many more innings left in them. So for even the best of, of, of seniors, uh, what we might call the golfers, so for the golfers, the A1C goal is to be under 7.5%, not the usual 7%. And if you then take the nursing home population on the other end, the goal is to be under 8.5% A1C. And then there's that in-between group where you, 
might use a goal of 8%. The ADIA guidelines also recommend not using gliburide because of its high rate of hypoglycemia, not using metformin when the GFR falls below 40, and not using sliding scale insulin as the sole form of, of treatment. Um, I think I'm going to skip a few slides. I always try to put too much in because I do want to get to this uh, point. So I ask the questions here, here, are your elderly patients getting buzzed? And so we're talking here about benzodiazepines and Z drugs. Well, in fact, uh, this Canadian data would suggest that a third of Canadian seniors are taking a psychotropic drug of one sort or another. 21% of seniors are taking a benzodiazepine or a Z drug. And of those patients taking them, 65% uh, are getting buzzed on a daily basis. And of course, we know that in nursing homes, the rate of psychotropic drug use is, is much higher. And in addition to the 21% of, of elders taking buzz, many of them are also taking another psychotropic drug at the, at the same time. Okay. So what are the factors that are associated with buzz use? Well, ironically, it's all the things that, that make a person frail and, and that make them least, res, least able to tolerate the buzz. So female gender is a strong risk factor for, for buzz use. Older age, you'll see that age 65 to 75, there's about 18.7% using buzz, whereas 85 plus, 25% of the population is, is buzzed. Polypharmacy, multimorbidity, lower education, all associated with the regular use of, of benzodiazepines and, and Z drugs. What are the consequences uh, of buzz use? Well, falls and fractures, for sure, uh, MVAs and other accidents, decreased physical performance as measured by things like uh, walking speed, grip strength, chair rises, etc. Cognitive decline, uh, tolerance to the drug, dependence on the drug, parasomnias, so those are complex nighttime behaviors such as sleep walking, sleep driving, sleep eating, sleep gambling, and uh, interestingly in the States that's given rise to what's known as the Ambien defense. Uh, that's that's uh, Zolpidem, where people say that they were just acting like an automaton, and I, I just woke up in the morning and there was my wife with a dagger in her chest, and I had blood all over my hands, and I have no idea what, what happened. That's the, the Ambien defense. And there's anterograde amnesia, and there's rebound insomnia and, and anxiety upon cessation. So this uh, group from UBC uh, calculated odds ratios for falls with psychotropic drugs. So for sedatives and hypnotics as a group, there's a 47% increased rate of falls. For benzodiazepines themselves, a 41% increase. And for antidepressants, uh, it just regular SSRIs, a 36% uh, increase in falls. Now that's not generally a sedation effect in SSRIs. What's, what's the link to falling? So the, the question is around why people fall with SSRIs, and we don't know. Um, SSRIs are as bad as tricyclics, for instance, and, and they're it's the same with virtually all of the antidepressants. We don't know why people fall. Uh, that's not been studies, it's only conjecture whether it's because people become a bit slapdash in the way they move around, but we don't know. And this group from U of T did a, a meta-analysis of uh, sedative hypnotics in older people with insomnia. And I think the message here is they just don't work as well as you might think they do. And, and you know, we probably all had this conversation with little old ladies who just don't want to give up their, their sleeping pill. Oh, I'll never sleep without my sleeping pill. They really don't work that well. So the number needed to treat for improved sleep quality is 13. The number needed to harm is six. The effect size uh, using Cohen's D is a paltry 0 0.14. Uh, the total increase in sleep time is 25 minutes, but that can be accomplished as well by uh, CBT. And they calculated odds ratios for adverse events, events such as adverse cognitive effects, uh, 4.78, adverse psychomotor effects, 2.61, daytime fatigue, 3.82, et cetera. 
We know that the use of benzodiazepines is associated with dementia, with the diagnosis of dementia. Uh, and we now have three studies that have, have shown this fairly consistently, the Packwood study from France, the Carfilly study from Wales, and, and a, a Taiwan study. So put together, what we could say is that patients who are prescribed benzodiazepines are about twice as likely to be diagnosed with a dementia. So this is basically like giving a stress test to the brain. If you want to find out who's got preclinical dementia in your practice, give them a benzodiazepine and, and sedate what's left of their cognitive functions and you're going to find out. So the question is whether it's cause and effect. Um, it's an association. It's, it's certainly an association, but if you're saying, is anybody saying that these drugs are neurotoxic in the sense that they cause plaques and tangles and neurodegeneration, nobody is suggesting that. Uh, these people would have the same amount of plaques and tangles, it's just that you, you no doubt, and this is conjecture, have just impaired what's left of their cognitive function. I think the other thing is that a, a lot of uh, physicians have this idea that, that the Z drugs are, are like Camelot, they're just, they're wonderful, you can use as much as you want, as long as you want, they're, they're, they're harmless drugs. So the Z drugs, that's Zopiclone, which is available in Canada, not available in the U.S., uh, S-Zopiclone, which is not available in Canada, but available in the U.S., um, and in fact, uh, at the bottom of the slide, you'll see that they sold $822 million worth of Lunesta last year in, in the United States and Zolpidem, which is available in Canada as a sublingual preparation, and Zaliplon, which was once available in Canada but taken off the market. So like benzos, uh, they are allosteric modulators of the GABA-A receptor complex, but they bind selectively to the alpha subunit that causes sedation. So they're sedative hypnotic without being um, anticonvulsant, muscle relaxant, anxiolytic. So they're just, they're selective um, uh, sedatives. They have a faster onset and a shorter elimination half-life, so they decrease sleep latency by 22 minutes. They improve sleep quality, but they don't improve sleep duration. And the benefits are that they do, in fact, have less tolerance, less dependency, and less residual effect. But the rub is that in Canada, we're using Zopiclone. And Zopiclone is the least selective of the Z drugs. And Zopiclone has the longest elimination half-life of the Z drugs, which is about seven hours in the, in the elderly. So it really does behave much more like a short-acting benzodiazepine, like say lorazepam. I point out that the Imovane product monograph does say that the maximum dose is 7.5 milligrams in all, not just the elderly, but all people. Um, and that they say treatment should usually not exceed seven to 10 consecutive days and not years, as is often done. <laughs> so summarizing the, the Z drugs, uh, they may be more purely sedative hypnotic, but less so for Zopiclone. They may in fact have less tolerance and dependency. There may be less residual effect, but less so for Zopiclone. But the important points are that there is no evidence that they cause any less cognitive impairment and that there's no evidence that they cause fewer falls. In fact, you'll see that, that Zolpidem actually has a, about the highest rate of uh, hip fractures compared to other uh, sedative hypnotics. So I'll just conclude by giving some strategies uh, for possible debuzzing. So I think the first thing is that we need to tell our patients that we're concerned about their use of uh, benzodiazepines and, and, and Z drugs, and that we want to wean them off. I think we have to get by our own, um, our own uh, enabling, and I think there's an awful lot of enabling that's, that's going on. Um, and I try to get patients off uh, buzz drugs a lot, and I work and I work to get them down, and I see the patient for a follow-up visit six months later, and it's just being put right back again, and, and I just get very frustrated over, over that. So clearly my views on, on this aren't, aren't consistent with, with many of the family physicians in the community. So recommend complete withdrawal rather than reduction or, or substitution, just as you would with an alcoholic. You don't say, I want you to cut down on your lorazepam. You, you say, no, I'd really like to see you get off this drug altogether. All um, and to do that, do a gradual and programmed withdrawal, probably over the course of two to six months, depending on how much they're on and how long they've been on it. 
and preferably use blister packs because there's just much less temptation than to just pop extra pills whenever they, they, they feel like it. Refer the most difficult cases, the ones where there's serious addiction problems, to addiction medicine. Uh, offer group or individual CBT for the underlying insomnia or anxiety. And tell patients up front to avoid alcohol because you know, so often you get them off the buzz just for them to go to booze instead. Uh, and we want to try to avoid that. And for those who are pre-contemplative, and I certainly see run into a lot of pre-contemplative individuals, consider a prescribing contract uh, where you limit them to a 30-day supply, in-person refills only, single prescriber, single pharmacy, et cetera, just exactly the way you would with an, an opioid. Well, I'm not well, I guess I am pretty much out of time, aren't, aren't I? So let me just conclude then by saying that for the elderly, less can be more. Uh, for those with less than 10 years of life expectancy, uh, first have a good look at the PIMS. Limit the buzz drugs to special situations, short-term use, and, and carefully monitored. And limit the potentially appropriate CPG recommended drugs to those with sufficient payoff rates. And that's my email address on the bottom if you want to make comments, questions, etc.